Okay, today in our module we are going to look at food chains and food webs and how energy is transferred and how we can create models of those using pyramids. So first off, we need to review some terms that you probably remember from biology or previous science classes. Uh, the first is trophic levels. Um, when we do food chains, a trophic level is um, the rank that an organism has in the feeding hierarchy. And those organisms are going to fit into one of three categories. They are either going to be producers, consumers, or the third category, detritivores and decomposers. So we will start with producers. Producers are the lowest on the food chain. They are at the first trophic level. We have two types. We have autotrophs, which are photosynthetic organisms like green plants, certain types of bacteria and algae. And then we also have chemosynthetic bacteria that are usually found on the deep ocean floor and they use, or deep underground, but they use geothermal heat instead of solar energy uh, to drive the chemical reactions. So our producers are those that um, produce the energy for themselves and for the rest of the food chain. Usually we refer to autotrophs as primary producers because they take sunlight, convert it into chemical energy in the form of glucose that's passed to the next trophic level. At the second trophic level we have our uh, primary consumers and they are generally known as herbivores because they are the vegetarians. They eat the primary producers. Then we have secondary consumers that are the third trophic level and they consume the primary consumers. They are the carnivores. Omnivores can fall at either primary or secondary. They can be the second trophic level, third trophic level, depending on what they're eating. Because omnivores eat both plants and animals. We can also have consumers at higher trophic levels. Um, if they are eating the secondary consumers, they are known as tertiary. That is the fourth trophic level. And occasionally, but it's pretty rare, a quaternary consumer uh, would be the fifth trophic level. Now these are usually, uh, the tertiary and quaternary are going to be your top carnivores. Um, they're your things like your birds of prey, um, mountain lions, you know, we have fewer of those organisms. Those are the ones that are usually um, on the endangered list, and we'll talk about why we have fewer of those organisms in just a minute. All right, the organisms that consume non-living organic matter are the detritivores and decomposers. They can um, fall at any trophic level because they can consume the producers, they can consume primary consumers, secondary consumers, and on up. So they're found at each trophic level. The two types, the tritivores are those that eat waste products and dead bodies, like millipedes would be an example. And then the decomposers generally eat leaf litter, and they're the ones that recycle the nutrients and enrich the topsoil. That's things like earthworms and bacteria. All right, so if we put that all together um, into a food chain, our primary producers are our first trophic level. Um, in this particular example, we see grass. Um, they are photosynthetic. And then we have an herbivore at our second trophic level, our primary consumers. In this example, we have cows eat the grass. And then if a human eats the cow, enjoy your hamburger, which eats the grass, the humans are going to be secondary consumers at the third trophic level. Now, when you are drawing food chains and food webs, um, anything that is in a box um, is in a flow diagram is considered a storage and then the arrows represent energy flow. So notice how the arrow goes from the grass to the cow and from the cow to the human because the arrows show you what direction the energy is flowing. It's not what is eating what, it's how the energy is moving through the trophic levels. When we um, move from one trophic level to the next, what you'll see is that the amount of energy that flows decreases, 
the biomass decreases and the number of organisms decreases. And this is mainly due to the second law of thermodynamics, which you remember uh, we talked about how energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it is usually um, converted to lower quality or heat. So what happens at each trophic level, um, your animals and your plants are undergoing respiration and are losing uh, some of that energy as heat. Um, so what we get if we create a graphical, mo graphical model um, of our food chains and food webs, we get a pyramid shape. All right, so if we look at this energy pyramid, um, starting with our primary producer, our grass at the bottom. This time our primary consumer is the grasshopper. Our secondary consumer is the rodent. And our tertiary consumer, or top carnivore in this chain, is the hawk. Now, at each level, um, energy is lost as heat. And it pretty much follows the pattern that each level in this pyramid or each trophic level contains about 10% of the energy from the trophic level below. So this, and this is obviously not drawn to scale, um, but your grasshoppers contain 10% of the energy that was produced by the grass in photosynthesis. 10% um, of what um, the energy that the grasshoppers get from the grass is passed on to the rodents and so on. Now, energy... Um, when we look at these pyramids, is usually calculated in units of flow because energy is flowing from one trophic level to the next. So um, here you can see our units are grams per meter square per year or joules, which is a unit of energy, joules per meter square per year. And for you IB folks, remember we write our units with negative exponents. AP, you can stick with these units that are more familiar. Okay, if we look at a biomass pyramid, which shows the dry weight of organisms at each trophic level, it's going to follow the similar shape. We have our um, pyramid, um, and there's going to be fewer organisms at the top because there's less energy available. Um, one of the things you may notice, if you think about what the largest um, organisms in the world are right now, it's the blue whale. The blue whale eats teeny tiny plankton that is photosynthetic, but it gets more energy from that plankton than it would if it ate something at a higher trophic level like the larger fish. Um, if you think about the dinosaurs, those that were herbivores like the brontosaurus were much larger than the um, carnivores. Um, so those that are at the top of our pyramids, both biomass and a numbers pyramid, which would also follow the same shape, um, are usually those that are on the endangered list because we have fewer of them. Now biomass is considered a unit of storage, not a flow, so here we have grams per meter square or joules per meter square. And notice the difference is that it's not per year because it's not flowing from one level to the next. This is how much is stored at any given time at each of these trophic levels. If we have a numbers pyramid, numbers pyramid and biomass pyramid is going to be the same. Unless, let's say that your primary producers are trees, you're going to have fewer trees than you would grass, so your numbers pyramid would have a smaller base. All right, so so far we've been looking at food chains, how energy is transferred from one trophic level to the next. If we combine multiple food chains, and we look at many different organisms at the various trophic levels, that's when we get a food web. Here is an example of a food web. So you see we have, um, you know, on this side here is a simple food chain. I've got um, the bears that eat the bees that eat the blossoms. Um, but over here, we have, you know, the bear that eats the fox that eats the birds, but you also have the wolf that eats the fox. The fox also eats the skunk. And so we have a much more complicated relationship. Now, as with any model, this is not complete. Um, there is no way that every organism in that ecosystem can be demonstrated on this one little whiteboard. We also have decomposers and detritivores acting at each of these levels. But notice once again that the arrows go in the direction of energy flow. So if the rabbit eats the bark from the oak tree, the energy is being transferred from the oak tree to the rabbit.
Okay, two more terms. Um, bioaccumulation is when any substance, and it looks like I smeared my type over here, but uh, builds up in the tissue of a living organism. Um, for example, uh, DDT is a pesticide that was once used, and it would run off from the land into the water where it would build up in the tissues of the fish. Well, if a bird of prey came in, swooped down, grabbed a fish, ate the fish, then that DDT would also accumulate in his tissues. Um, when this happens, when you have a substance that is passed from one trophic, trophic level to the next, you get biomagnification. Um, because if you think about in terms of fish, um, let me get my next slide. All right, your producers are going to have, um, these little dots represent DDT, um, your producers are going to have um, DDT built up in their tissues. Um, at the next trophic level, here I have my primary consumers, my little itty bitty fish, that are also swimming in the same water, so they're going to build up the DDT, it's going to bioaccumulate in their tissues, um, but when they eat the primary producers, they eat that photosynthetic uh, plankton, then not only do they get the DDT that was in the water in their tissues, but also whatever was built up in the tissues here. So you can see the amount is more concentrated. And then when you have the big fish that eat the little fish, he's going to have uh, the DDT that he picked up from the water plus the DDT that all the little fish that he ate get picked up from the water. All right, and then so what happens, these birds of prey that eat the fish have very concentrated DDT in their tissues. And one of the things that we saw as a result was that the eggshells um, on the eggs that they laid were very thin and brittle. And so the eggs weren't hatching correctly uh, or the young were dying because of the thin shells. And so we were seeing reduced numbers of these birds of prey. Now we no longer use DDT. Um, uh, due to more awareness of what some of our pesticides and how they're dangerous to us. And if you remember, Rachel Carson, uh, who wrote Silent Spring, uh, brought awareness uh, to DDT and its dangers back in the 60s. All right, on, um, the next thing I want you to do on your module is to watch the video clip of what happened in Minamata Bay, Japan, and you'll see another example of bioaccumulation and biomagnification of mercury.